Hey, thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, <laughs> your voice already. <laughs> I mean, people, when people meet you, do they ask you, what do you do with that voice? <laughs> Invariably, if someone asks me, do you... Uh, you do voiceover work, uh, are you a DJ, but they never think opera singer. That's like the last thing on the list, but I hear it all the time, yeah. yeah. I bet you do, because as soon as I walked in here, I'm like, whoa, powerful voice. And it's it's one thing, because I've been able to interview several opera singers, mm -hmm. but you carry it with you every day. Just tell us a bit about your journey. You know, what got you started into opera? You know, opera and I found one another at the age of 30, believe it or not. Um, <clears throat> I always talk about, I went to high school performing arts, and... Um, I was in the marching band, and I never really wanted to be in the chorus, but in order to stay at the school and be in the School of the Arts, that I auditioned for in the band, uh, you had to take two periods of performing arts. And I wanted to be on the football team. After the first football game in the marching band, I was like, I don't want to be up here with these guys. I want to be out there with the cool guys. So <laughs> in order to stay, I had to audition for the chorus. And I became a full-time chorister just so I could play football. And, was, you know, those two worlds really never left me. But uh, in – in joining the chorus, we were introduced to classical music at an early age, the age of 15. I was singing the tuba Miriam and all the bass solos for the Mozart Requiem. And then my senior year, I guess I was 16, 17, then we did Haydn's Creation, the Robert Shaw edition of the Haydn's Creation. So the classical music book kind of hit me then. And then I left it all and went and played football in college. Mm -hmm. And then I worked in corporate America for a while. And then I went back to study opera at the age of 30 after singing uh, the national anthem and the Lord's Prayer, at, national anthem at sporting events, the Lord's Prayer at weddings and stuff like that. People heard my voice all the time and thought, you should be doing something with that voice. Uh, but, you know, I'm a brother. It's like we don't come from a community where we are aware that this is an option viably to pursue uh, vocally. So, uh, yeah, but it's, it's, it's really weird. It's felt like I felt like a fish jumping back into water once the opera world reached out to me and said, hey, you should probably start studying this. So and it's, I've never had to work a day in my life ever since. So, wow. Yeah, because yeah, it's one of those things where it's like exciting. Oh, wait. OK, hold on. It's one of those things where it's really exciting because at the end of the day, you also uh, get to do something that you love. And that's exactly what I think so many people, you know, want to understand. Like, what is it that they can do that doesn't feel like work? And so going back to it at the age of 30, that's a huge feat because already now you've probably, you know, had some professional experience, as you said, in corporate America. You know, you, you got maybe a family established at that point. What was that transition like for you to say, you know what, I am, I'm going to take this seriously? Well, I mean, you know, I'm, I, I tried to take it like a business approach. I I had enough money put away to to live for two years. And I thought this, this is a two-year experience, mm -hmm. experiment. Um I'm going to try it out and see what happens. You know, if, if it doesn't work, I can always go back to work. So it was just, you know, it was lots of sleepless nights, lots of discussions, my family. Uh, yeah, it was just, it was, it was, it was a scary thing for me. And, uh, but I was, you know, I, I bet on myself and yeah. I said, I'm going to do the best I can for this next period of time and see what happens. And, yeah, it worked. Well, you know, tell us a bit about that acceptance then. Like, how were you received in the opera community? Because, you know, this is something that could take you all over the world. I mean, people are doing operas everywhere. Tell us a bit about how you, you got to be received from the other side to be like, oh, whoa, this powerful voice is now joining the ranks. Well, you know, there's, uh, there's always trials and tribulations. Um, when you come into the opera world like I did from nowhere, uh, there's always people that look at and think, you know, what is this about? Okay, it's a sensational thing that's going to last for a few years, but it'll be over with. You know, he doesn't have the training. He didn't come from the right pedigree. You know, he doesn't have a degree in music. He didn't go to Juilliard. He didn't go to Manhattan School. So, you know, how good can this possibly be or how good can this possibly get? You know, mm -hmm. uh, can his aptitude adapt accordingly? But, you know, every every obstacle that was put in front of me, and I don't consider an obstacle. I don't consider, I mean, you can look at it two ways. It was either an obstacle or an opportunity. And I looked at both. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an obstacle, meaning it was challenging for me to try to rise to the occasion. But it's also an opportunity for me to get better, prove that I can do it, and prove to myself that I can do it, and prove to the opera world that I could do this. So it was just li literally a series of accomplishments that had to take place. And so, you know, the first two years, I mean, it was just rough. You know, I knew how to sing the Lord's Prayer, but I never sang in Italian before. I never mm -hmm. sang in, in German before. I never sang in Russian. I never sang in French. So I had to learn how to do all those things. I'd never been on a real operatic stage. So, um, you know, I've sung oratorio because I was in the chorus, but I've never like worn a costume and been a character and had to relate to another character. So it was just fast learning, lots of learning. I often like to say it's like drinking water out of a fire hydrant. It's just coming at you nonstop. And you try to gather as much as you can. 
Uh, the psychological part within oneself is understanding that, you know, for 90% of the time, you hear the things that you don't do well, so that you can try to they push you to try to correct those things. And uh, therein lies the discipline and the self-assuredness and the confidence in knowing that when presented with something that's challenging, you have the ability to overcome that. Mm -hmm. um, and I was able to do that. I think my athletic background, just being an ex-athlete and getting used to coaching, uh, being able to to immediately and instantaneously make a return on what was input into me, I think that was important. You know, as far as being able to adapt on the fly, with uh, adapt on the fly in on command, on demand in the operatic world. So it's mm -hmm. it's certainly a complex journey, so to speak. But uh, you know, one of discipline and fortune. Uh, you know, within the first few weeks of studying opera, I knew that th I had done the right thing as far as making the choice to do so. Then it became a you know, a matter of, am I going to, am I going to reach the potential that everyone says I have? And my focus then became reaching the potential that everyone thought I had, because the one thing I didn't want to do is not reach that potential. So, you know, self-drive, lots of commitment. You got to have talent, you know, but the discipline and work ethic is the part that I think people don't really realize is there. You have to have that too. So yeah, I mean, and and those two things really can carry you forward in so many different ways, right? In so many different industries. So I love hearing your connection to that, particularly in your journey. Uh, you know, as you were like, all right, I'm gonna leave some of the things I've known behind. I'm stepping out, believing in myself. I'm gonna really bet on myself, as you said. That's really important in the in this journey in particular. Well, you know, I, I mean, this is one thing I gotta say. You know, I, I talk about this often, but now I almost can't even say it because I've interviewed so many black opera singers, right, right. you know, uh, in terms of that kind of opening up. Right. I mean, you know, we think black community doesn't automatically think opera is for them. You know, like going to the opera seems like maybe it's too expensive or it's not something that has really been uh, promoted in black communities often. And so tell us a bit about your your perspective there as a black man, a strong black man, right, going into opera. You know, how has it been for you in terms of some of those racial uh, outlines and those racial elements? Yeah, so, you know, people don't gravitate towards that which they're not familiar with. Uh, so, you know, we're black folks. We like to go to comedy club, jazz club, R&B, hip hop, you know, that kind of thing. We go to church, do the gospel thing. That's our norm, you know. Um, the first opera I was in was Aida by Verdi. And there's a moment <clears throat> in her famous aria where she's uh, praying and, and, and reminiscing about being back home and she's missing it. And there's a whole, there's a whole segment there that sounds like a black hymn called Sweet Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I was like, that music is that's our music or our music there, you know, there's some similarities there. So I started finding little light motifs like that, start finding things that were familiar. And then here's the coolest thing. Like when I go to a new city, you know, I'll go to the barbershop. I haven't been to the barbershop now. Cause I got, I got to have this beer for the show. So it's, I'm not normally like raggedy, but um, the car, because of my part, I have to add to it. But anyway, this whole thing, I'll go to the barbershop. When I was younger, I go play hoops. I'll go find spots where people hang out, go to black restaurants. And they find out what I do, and I'll invite them to the show. A lot of times I give them tickets just to get them there. And invariably, not only do they enjoy the experience, but a lot of them go when I'm not even on stage now. Like, yeah. I have people that have become patrons and members of the Opera House because it was cool. They got to dress up. <clears throat> they got to wear the tuxes, you know, rent a limousine, go have a nice dinner, take their girlfriend, take their wife, take their boys, and they go five deep. And it was just a great experience, you know. Um, I tell people that the opera, you shouldn't be intimidated by it. It is not necessarily just for the aristocracy. Um, that's a misnomer. In fact, Mozart said opera was written for the people. You know, mm -hmm. one of the famous, most famous operatic composers in the world ever, you know, it was written for the general public. So, you know, the, the experience I say is like going to the movie, but you have a better soundtrack and the action's happening right in front of you and it's live. Same storylines, you know, even in this show that we're doing here, it's it's a love triangle that really isn't a love triangle. It's about betrayal. You know, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm the king and I send my nephew, my favorite person, my best friend to go find this wife that I was too shy to approach. And he's going to secure her for me. Well, he ended up making love to her and falling in love with her. So I, I and then I walk on the scene like, yo, where is she at? And they're like, uh, yeah. So what happened was and so I'm broken, you know, and it's 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 a mess. You know, it's just straight drama. So. These storylines that we celebrate and put on screen now are not brand new to us. They've been going on for forever. And uh, it's just nice to see it displayed in a different language with a different soundtrack. You know, I think it's a beautiful experience. So you, it's a long answer to your short question, but 
you know, yes, black people should embrace and come to it. It's not foreign to everybody, but it's just not the most popular thing we do. Right. But I think you'll find if you participate, you'll actually enjoy it. So Yeah, I definitely have. And yeah. and you know, the fact that you you may be singing in another language, but the subtitles are in English, I right. can follow along. And I think that that's also too something that I've been telling my friends and family about. Like, you know, honestly, there there is no, you know, barrier for you to come and enjoy this. And I love how you say it like it's an opportunity to come and get dressed up, yeah. maybe do something a little bit bigger, a little bit more grandiose. You can. And I also told my friend, I said, hey, let's just go in what we got on. Like at the end of the day, yeah, nobody's going to scoff at us. You know, the idea that, you know, you have to succumb to a certain thing is not true. And I really experienced that personally. Well, you know, I mean, we are kind of taking the comments you are approach like going to church now. Yeah. It's like I tell people all the time, if you get off work at 630 and the opera starts at 7, wear your khakis, you know, <laughs> wear your jeans, you know, just come chill because – you know, it, it really is come as you are. You can make whatever you want to of the experience. You know, yeah. uh, we, you know, you if you want to make it a nice night and rent a limousine and have a five star dinner, you can do that. If you want to just show up with your khakis on your blue jeans, your flip flops, you can do that. <laughs> yeah. You know, no one's going to scoff you and look at you funny because, you know, it is for everybody. And, you know, we're just happy you're there, you know, uh, to enjoy the experience. And I think that opera audiences nowadays are so happy to see people there. And it's like going to the football game, you know, uh, I'm an ex-athlete, so I always relate everything to sports. But one of the things I think is beautiful about sports and music is that it, it blends communities. Mm -hmm. So if you go see the Seahawks play and the doctor sitting next to you, the garbage man sitting next to the janitor, sitting next to the lawyer, sitting next to the preacher, for that three hours, they're going to be best friends right. if they're on the same squad. They're going to high-five each other. They're going to hug each other. They're going to yell at the referees. They're going to cheer <laughs> for the team. And they don't care who they are and where they are. And say, I think the same thing happens at the Opera House. Mm -hmm. you know. And it's just a matter of trusting that Someone that actually does it for a living is on stage is telling you to try this. It really is a real, it's a real experience. So yeah, it really is. And and I agree with you on that. I mean, the first opera that I saw here in Seattle was blue, right? Oh, wow. And uh yeah, like <laughs> yeah, like I'm like, oh my God, all black cast, you know, kind of what you're talking about. They had a lot of these kind of like gospel rhythmic, you yeah. know, tunes in there. Um, but it was also a story that so many black community members could, you know, really connect with. Right. And you know, just as you were describing this plot here, I was reminded of Best Man. I'm like, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, like exactly. a, a movie that is beloved right. in black communities all across America and probably the world. But just the idea is that these stories, these narratives aren't new. And yet we can find ourselves really connecting to them. It's exciting because we actually have a clip of you up uh -oh. on stage. We get to actually see. Yeah, we get to actually <laughs> see you singing right here. Oh my wow. goodness. Look, we're just looking up at the screen. We're both like stuck in it. But wow, such a powerful voice. Tell us a bit about this character and, you know, the experience that playing this role has now added to your opera career. Well, okay, that's, that's a twofold question, so to speak. But like in this very scene here, this is me, uh, the initial confrontation. So what happens is I show up on the boat, I walk out with my squad, I'm the king. So I got like, the Secret Service with me, but the Secret Service in the sense of they have swords, not yeah. guns, but they all roll in with me, and I'm like, I walk into the situation, I see my my dude with the girl that's supposed to be marrying me, everybody's looking at me like I'm crazy, and that's me saying to the dude that brought me there, my boy is supposed to like go make sure everything's good before I arrive, I'm like, why would you put me here like this in front of all these people? 
did you really think this is the way to handle this? Mm. That's the first thing I say. Then the second thing I say, what you heard there was, look at him. He's supposed to be my boy. Wow. That's supposed to be my best friend. Look at him. He's a dude I trusted the most on this planet. No one even understands and can comprehend the hurt I'm feeling right now. Mm. The embarrassment in front of all these people. And then I, I say that, then I send them away. And then I turn to him and say, bruh, like I literally say this. It's not bruh, but mm -hmm. it's literally saying, bruh, this is your boy. How are you going to do me like that? Look at me. How are you going to do me like that? So it's, it's real intense. You know, yeah. it's like, it's one of those, it's one of those, uh oh, moments because, uh oh, he here, you know, and I'm like the big boss, I'm the king. Yeah. So that's what that whole scene is about. And it literally is about maybe 14 to 15 minutes, depending on how fast the conductor is going that day mm -hmm. and how much breath I have, um, of me just saying, you know, you dogged me out, man. I can't believe you did that. And you know how I felt about her. And then I walk over to her and said, we supposed to be this, that, and the other. And like, I can't even, you know, so it's a whole just complete mm -hmm. utter breakdown. So that's the answer to that part of the question. The answer to what it's done for my career. Well, you know, as one is coming through the opera ranks, you know, you build on characters. So my first uh, entry into the world, I was always the king. Basis, kings, gods, fathers, priests. Those are the roles that we play. But one dimensional. I walk on stage. You do what I tell you to do. We leave, you know. And then it becomes, you know, you start playing more complex characters that I walk on stage, you do what you tell you, that I have some reflective moments of myself. Or, you know, I play the role of the assassin, like, I'm really cool, but I'm about to kill you. So it's just <laughs> adding layers to my ability to, to develop a character. And this right here is the latest entity of such, where it's like a multifaceted person who really looks one-dimensional, but inside he really is like dealing with a whole lot of issues. So you get to see me really just in a, in a to take this monstrous figure me, myself, also being this big, powerful guy and breaking down in front of everybody and, and letting my soul bear about this pain and agony that I'm going through. And that's his whole existence throughout the opera, but it's just different ebbs and flows. He gets angry, of course. He's hurt. He doesn't really cry because he's a king, but he's hurt. So, you know, it's, it's just interesting how, you know, I've been able to and I've been blessed with the opportunity to continue to add layers to my ability to develop characters over time. And this is just another obstacle slash opportunity to show myself and the rest of the opera world that I can do all kinds of things. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you know, one of the things that I don't think gets talked about enough is the acting in opera. Oh, yeah. Right. I mean, just there in that moment. As you're taking a breath and after you belt out this uh, fantastic note, you can tell that you're doing this internal reflection on your own pain, <laughs> right? Like, you, I mean, it, that for me as a thespian myself and, and have done musical theater and everything else, when I, when I go to the opera, I'm so intrigued mm -hmm. by the acting yeah. that is taking place. And a lot of the times it's being done in between moments of singing. There's so much nuance <laughs> that going on there so i mean kudos to you i cannot wait to come and see you on friday i am looking forward to this um and, and to being there i might have to dress up and do it fancy well, on friday i mean you already dress look at you well you, you know fly, it, so. it's kind of a thing for me yeah but. wear that to the opera it's <laughs> yeah. gonna be that's dope I mean, people will be taking pictures of you like, there we real. go <laughs> uh morris thank you so much for being here and and giving us your experience right here at the seattle opera i'm so glad that you are playing the role of king mark i can't wait to see you on Friday. Thank you so much for having me here and I look forward to seeing you. Absolutely. You get to look right there and just let people know how they can come and check you out in the upcoming performance. Yes, Seattle Opera. I think the website is seattleopera.org. Uh, the name of the opera is Tristan and Isolde by Ricard Wagner. And we'll be doing four more shows at the uh, Symphony Hall here. Oh, not Symphony Hall. The, the Opera House. Yeah. Uh, McCall Sif Opera House. Uh, S Seattle Opera. So yeah, McCall Hall. Yeah, McCall Hall. Yeah, it's Seattle Opera. There you go. There it is. I never have to do that part. Like I know. It's always done for me. I know. A lot of people don't. <laughs> so that's why I need to be prepping my folks. Like, hey, I'm gonna give you that opportunity at the end. But I just thank you so much for thank making you. time in your busy schedule to join me today. I appreciate. it. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. What a pleasure, you guys. Of course, you guys. Know